Hail and hello, everyone. Welcome to the Random Heathen Ramblings podcast, a Midgard Musings production. Join me, Jesse, your host, as we discuss random heathen related topics and various other things in an attempt to find where, if any, heathen worldviews can be applied. You can support this podcast by clicking on the Linktree link in the description or show notes. You can also follow me on all of my social media platforms, including Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and become a patron on Patreon. Join me every Thursday morning at 9 a.m. Eastern, 8 a.m. Central on all major podcast streaming platforms, including Apple and Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Pandora, and many, many more. If you wish to have your voice heard on the Random Heathen Ramblings podcast, you can dial in to 615-671-9832. Thank you all once again for listening to the Random Heathen Ramblings podcast. Joy and hail to you all. All right. Hail, hail, hail. All hail. <clears throat> and 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 that's uh that's the southern uh version of uh all hail. All hail. Anyway, hail and welcome back, everyone. Jesse here from uh, Midgard Musings. The random Ethan Ramblings podcast is fully underway today. Got a very special guest lined up, um, a guest who I've been wanting to bring on this podcast since last year. Um, a man of many talents, a man of mystery, a man of myth. Um, I'm going to hold off on <clears throat> pronouncing his name because I think I know the correct pronunciation of it, but I don't want to speak out of turn. So stick around for today's episode. I think you're going to really enjoy it. Uh, I hope you do. And if you do, make sure that you upvote this uh, you know, podcast production on any one of the multiple streaming and uh, publishing platforms that you may absorb this podcast. To all my patrons on Patreon, I want to send a very special shout out and thanks. I apologize for missing this month's uh, rune reading, uh, rune cast for you all, um, from, from getting COVID at the beginning of the month and, and moving into some new work duties, uh, responsibilities, roles, things of that nature. It's been a little bit hectic and, um, I don't know, it, it's weird how things have landed for this time of year for me in the past. It, it always tends to, I don't know, just kind of set things off, um, on an interesting foot, um, but we're, we're managing, we're, we're getting through it. And I hope you all are as well. Uh, so yes, thank you to my patrons. Thank you to my channel members, subscribers, followers on Facebook, Twitter, and I guess Instagram, even though the Instagram platform seems to not want to share most of what I, what I publish, I may have to do some technical troubleshooting for for that side of things but we've got our incense going here right now we've got some frankincense dual action going here double barrel double barrel action like in the wild west baby all right um do want to send out a quick reminder to everybody in the middle tennessee area that the middle tennessee heathens uh facebook group that i uh pretty much run um to, to help bring people of various polytheistic paths or interests or uh, kind of together. We, we have uh, recently started to have public meetups and the next one here in Murfreesboro, Tennessee is taking place once again at the McAllister's, McAllister's Deli um, on Medical Center on July, I believe it's the 30th. It's the last Saturday of this month. So not this um, coming weekend, but the next. So um, if you want the details, check the show notes for that, the address, the time, and everything is going to be posted uh, in the description and show notes of this 
podcast, the video description, wherever. Show notes and if it's the podcast, video description area, if it's the YouTube premiere. Um, so that's pretty much the biggest, uh, I don't know, news activities, things coming off, coming around here in the Middle Tennessee area. It's still hot as balls out here, ladies and gentlemen. It is, uh, you know, going on to, on two months of very oppressive heat. Um, and I'm freaking over it. Um, this northern boy doesn't do well in the heat. And uh, I, I, I can't wait for things to start chilling out, quite literally. Um, I'm probably going to be waiting for at least another two months for that to happen, at the very least. You know, it's, it's bad when you can't even sit outside at the end of the day when the sun goes down and enjoy a drink or a pipe or something outside in, in the cool air. It's bad when, you know, it's 95 degrees uh, at like nine o'clock at night. But anyway, it is what it is. It's what I get for, you know, moving to Tennessee and uh, setting up residence here. So, you know, you got to roll with the punches, either that or get the hell out, as they say, right? Um, but I don't plan on going anywhere. Not on the long term. My wife, my life is here. Um, so, yeah, just going to have to deal with it. Um, but all right. I think that pretty much does it for all of the housekeeping type stuff. Um, again, very excited to welcome in our guest today. Um, you may know his face and, and uh, voice from his various projects, um, including The Weirding Way, Myth Maker Productions. Uh, I believe there's a YouTube channel. There's going to be all kinds of information that he's going to be sharing with me today. And once again, I do not want to uh, mispronounce his name. So um, I will introduce you as soon as I bring him in here to join us on this week's episode of the Random Heathen Ramblings podcast. Let's welcome him in. All right, folks, um, we do have a very special guest, as I mentioned earlier, coming to us uh, remotely from Canada in the British Columbia regions. Uh, so welcome to the podcast, Heron Oshie. Thanks so much. Yeah, it's great to be here from deep in the Valhalla Mountains of Canada. <laughs> Is that literally their name? Like if we were to try to get to these mountain ranges in, in Canada, is it the Valhalla Mountains? It's actually the Valhalla Mountains. It's Valhalla Park. Uh, nice. I live right on the edge of Valhalla Park. I actually lived off grid, um, literally on the border of Valhalla Park for about four years um, with full off grid power. And my backyard was like as far as humans could walk. Mm. Wilderness uh, were the Valhalla Mountains named after all the old gods. And then on the other mountain range is actually Mount Loki. Mount Loki is not in the Valhallas. <laughs> ah, that's that's uh, that's appropriate. Right. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah. <laughs> that guy, he's he, he's he's kind of been, you know, he, he had his chance with, with Asgard and they kind of gave him the old boot, as it were. <laughs> there is a Mount Loki here, but it's on the other side of another mountain range. Gotcha. Gotcha. And you're you're native to, to British Columbia, right? You're you're a born and um, bred Canadian. I did, or... up, uh, I did grow up in Canada and was born in Canada. Um, I grew up out east in Ontario and okay. moved to British Columbia in my 20s my early 20s fantastic my band and i, I bought a big bellic hippie bus from some hippies and uh our uh, rock and metal pagan bands drove across canada and landed in the mountains here and stayed in british columbia that must have been a uh i mean i can only imagine like driving i've, I've driven cross country here in uh in the u.s um, and, and just seeing the different landscapes, um, seeing the transition from how it is on the East Coast of the United States to how it is on the West Coast. I'm sure that there's maybe some similar transitions and things from from going across Canada East to West. But it's, it's such a, a, a mind blowing thing when you, you know, see the Rockies or, you know, you, you travel across the Badlands or you're, you know, going across like Death Valley or just some of these other like really iconic it, geographical it was, locations was kind of the equivalent from uh growing up around new york and traveling to california mm, yeah yeah so I'm, I'm originally from new york you know and i moved to tennessee and since moving to tennessee uh about 16 years ago or so i've i've traveled all almost all of the lower 48 you know uh, continental lower 48 united states haven't been to Alaska, haven't been to 
of all places, Montana. Like I, I've, I've somehow happened to miss Montana and Idaho, but uh, those three places I haven't been to, but all of the rest of the lower 48. And I've been to Hawaii too, which is a amazing location if you've never been. Nice, nice. But, but yeah, guys. Um, yeah, so um, Heron, great name, by the way. Um, for those that uh, follow what I do, um, I, I, you know, on the, on the Midgard Musings page and some of the stuff that I post about, I, I've, I've really gotten into going on these like barefoot nature walks as part of kind of like just my mental health vacations, you know, like taking care of myself physically, spiritually, holistically, going out into nature, walking barefoot and walking through this river. Um, and as of late, there's been a very active presence of the water bird, a heron. And even though your name is, is not spelled the same way, it is pronounced as it is, you know, the actual bird. So it's kind of neat to me just to know like uh we we've we've talked around having you on this podcast almost i think since last year mm -hmm. you know and and you had some other uh projects and things going on which I'm, I'm i'm anxious to talk about you know the things that you're known for and what you're involved in um so it, it's really great to finally get you know and we've had some other scheduling hiccups along the way but we're here we are finally more than halfway through this year um finally getting a chance to to sit down and talk so it's uh it's pretty special for me and really appreciate your you know presence here and being being available great i'm stoked to be here stoked to chat great so i do want to talk about um when i when when i've uh when i think when i first met you online um i don't even remember exactly the 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 correlation of the connection and it might have been through some like pagan music group or something like that but following what you do publicly um, you've got your hands in many different pots or you wear many different hats. So why don't you uh, kind of share with the people here um, what it is you do in the entertainment sector and, and, and some things that people might be aware of or know about. Yeah, I mean, what I've done the longest and I'm most recognized for and most known for is uh, Mythmaker Productions. So Mythmaker is a pagan heathen ritual theater production company that I've been doing for over 20 years. Um, and it all started from pagan ceremony and pagan ritual, like different, you know, backgrounds that I learned from. And I never went to theater school. You know, I'm not a theater director that went to university or anything like that. I learned ritual in a traditional, traditional Scottish witchcraft coven. Um, and that's where my theater came from. And that was a lot of the the ways that that the high priestess practiced was a lot about invocation and and really drawing down the gods and drawing down you know animistic characteristics into us and so that's kind of where my theater background came from and mythmaker kind of started out here in the Valhalla's um, I studied traditional Scottish witchcraft in out east and then when I came out here there was a lot of big kind of pagan hippie gatherings, um, but not a lot of people really knew what they were doing magically other than like singing and dancing and drumming under the full moon. And I was like, you know, you can, you can do things with that. And so we started doing giant pagan gatherings um, on the high holidays, on the full moons, um, summer solstice, things like that. Summer solstice was the biggest one. And, uh, and basically, you know, after several years of a bunch of us locally collaborating with that and me, being the, the ritual leader doing like 500 person rituals in these big festival kind of atmospheres. Um, we cleared the space the one time we built this whole gateway and had like rows of didgeridoos and sage and things like that to have people come back for the, for the full moon ritual or for the summer solstice ritual. And there was this one guy with his kid and he was like really uncomfortable and he was like, like what's going on here? What, what is all this? And I was like, well, we're doing a summer solstice ritual with the community. And, you know, and he was like, I didn't come for this. And I was like, well, it's on the poster. And <laughs> we're going to clear the space and bring it back in. And uh, he was very uncomfortable with the whole thing. And it kind of, you know, we did the ceremony and the ritual and it was amazing. 500 people dancing around the fire, like music, all kinds of things. Um, very non-denominational in that scenario, but just very animistic. And, uh, but it really hit me. I was like, you know, this guy was really scared, you know, and I understand like the culture and Christianity and all that around, you know, paganism and heathenism and that. But for myself, I was like in these small communities, you know, like, are we preaching to the converted? 
you know, is it all like the pagan and heathens and people comfortable with that that are comfortable, but what about the grander community? And that's, you know, in the covenant. And one of the things I learned, because I practiced solitaire before that, was how much traditional Scottish witchcraft and a lot of these Northern European pagan traditions were about community. It weren't just about one person. It was about a, commu- a family and a community surviving in nature through animistic perceptions of how we engage with nature and magic. And so mm-hmm. it's kind of how Mythmakers start was out of that ritual. The next year I was like, well, let's do a show. Let's do a theatrical production and we'll still, you know, do the magic, but we'll do it as an interactive kind of theatrical production with stories and characters and the whole thing. And so that was the birth of Mythmaker of Ritual Theater. And then the whole community is involved, you know, and like Grandma Ginny and little Billy, they're like, look at the guy with the fire swords, Billy, isn't that cool? And meanwhile, I've got like, you know, the horn crown on and I'm like invoking the ancient gods, mm-hmm. you know, but at the same time, it's a more tangible trend, you know, for the grander community. And so that was the beginning of Mythmaker about 20 some odd years ago. And since then, I've got a giant green antlered tour bus named Yagara that we uh, travel around the West Coast of North America doing ritual theater at festivals. Um, so I've done that for a long time. And then before that, I was in bands and played music. And so at some point through Mythmaker, I realized this needs to be a band. This needs, uh, I was always writing the soundtracks and doing a lot of the interactive stuff with theater and storytelling, but I was like really to engage with culture, engage with culture and to take this to the next level. It needs to be a band and music was always my first passion. And so that's where the weirding way began. And so the weirding way was Mythmaker into a full like heathen, pagan, progressive rock, psychedelic, you know, ritual music scenario with the aspects of music. Mythmaker to it. So really, the Weirding Way and Mythmaker are both from the same visionary root, from the same inspiration of animism and ritual and, you know, in those things. And in, in the Weirding Way, I'm doing like, you know, I've got the horn and I'm doing the mead ceremonies and the music is all deeply cathartic and, you know, very Tool-esque and Vodruna, Heilung-esque and, you know, in mm-hmm. its, its hybridisms. Um, and yeah, so that's, it was the Weirding Way. Um, psychedelic pagan heathen shaman band uh seven piece with like 12 to 15 performers and antlers and horns and shields and fire swords and all that yeah. stuff um, and then my other personal offering is in more of my my animistic shamanic path is the warrior's path and that's my whole youtube channel where i do rune meditations and counseling and and talking about you know the pagan path and the heathen path and how we engage in with each other and with society and how to deconstruct our perception back into some of the old ways so yeah those are some of the things that's you know (laughs) there's a few of the things that i do um yeah it takes over my life that's that's what i'm Uh, i would say so i mean it sounds it sounds like an absolute lifestyle like this doesn't this isn't no this is no casual you know, you know, hobby for you, like this is life. You live it. I, I live it. It's 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 pretty much, you know, I eat it for breakfast, I go to sleep at night. Um yeah. doing myth maker, the weirding way, um warrior's path. You know, right now I'm bringing a whole crew to Burning Man. I run a hundred and fifty person camp burning man and a fifty person fire ritual there. Um we this will be our twelfth year at the burn. And uh, yeah, it's a whole heathen pagan camp. We've got a mead hall with like five kegs of mead and my bus now turns into a giant flaming Viking ship. Um, (laughs) Wow. And yeah, it's like a village of people that go out to the uninhabitable desert where, you know, nothing lives out there. And it's an 80,000 person city pops up for two weeks and we build our 150 person Viking village in that city and light up the fire swords and, you know, build fire breathing dragons and you know do a- wow that shit i had I, I didn't realize for fun. yeah i, I, ne- for I never yeah I, I never realized how big of a production that just burning man itself was um i've watched some videos online and 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 i think even yeah. some of them were uh videos that that came through from you or or at least were released through the 
warrior's path youtube channel or somewhere like i saw like some of the some of the sequences of events that took place and i'm like this is massive like this you know I'll literally like you say a whole city's population pops up in the middle of nowhere um how does how does how does that even get coordinated like what is the do you have any insight to that i mean you've been a part of it for the last decade plus it's, in, in, in your way but like how does that how does that work it's a really interesting organic anomaly um the scenario burning man itself no one could have planned it in the way that it's evolved and the way that it's happened um really it was just an accident so i don't know if the fates you know i don't know if the norns woven into existence or who or what did what to make this thing happen but it's a cultural anomaly anomaly that uh inspires new paradigm and new culture you know like i i didn't go for years we did ritual theater different festivals and events and we did the midnight ceremonies and for years people were like do you what a burning man you're so burning man and you know they had the culty glazed i'd look about burning man and i found it really annoying actually and i was like no we we do ritual theater we do intentional theater and burning man just sounds like a big debaucherous shit fest in the desert like we don't go to raves we don't do you know <laughs> that kind of thing we're like yeah. no no you don't understand burning man and i was like you know i got i gotta pay my heathens like we're surviving like you know at that time we were traveling like two and a half months on my bus and you know traveling nomadic lifestyle you know in that way and i'm like i gotta feed these people and uh burning man doesn't pay anybody you know burning man you know you gotta buy your ticket to burning man and i was like we'll go when someone buys us tickets and the next year a philanthropist from spain saw my website and called me up and was like i love what you do with the ritual and the theater and the mythology and the symbolism like come can't, we want you to camp with us at burning man and i was like we don't go and he was like i'll pay all your gas and pay all your tickets and i got wow. off the phone i'm like guys we're on a burning man and uh <laughs> my tour bus my green horn blew blew up the the transmission blew that summer and i called them up to cancel and he was like how much is another bus and so the bus that i have now that turns into the giant dragon stage was actually bought for us to go to Burning Man. The philanthropist bought us a new bus. Uh, and I showed up on Playa, as they call it, in the desert. And I put my foot in my mouth. I was so wrong. I It gave me hope for humanity. I got there and I was like, this is the most amazing thing I think I've ever seen or heard of humans doing. You know, and my mind was blown seven times in the first day. Of just you know it's a gift culture it's a, you know, a radical self-reliance so everyone brings what they need um i've been you know something in my perception has been training for the apocalypse since i was like four years old so for me this is ideal apocalypse training for when the shit hits the fan and it all goes down those of us that have really adapted to the way of burning man are going to have an advantage over the rest of society yeah. and it's you know it wasn't the debaucherous shit show party that I thought it was. I mean, people are there and they're partying and they're, you know, and there's like DJ yeah. rave stages and that, but really it's, it's a new, it's a whole other paradigm. Like hmm. just the concept of gift economy is so outside of our Western consumer culture. It takes days to acclimatize to the fact that you got radical self-reliance. So you bring everything you need and then it's a gift economy. So you bring things to give. And yeah. everywhere is just people looking you in the eye people wanting to, you know, teach each other things, show each other things, give each other things. And it's like, it's phenomenal. And then you got guys with like flamethrowers, like, you know, or like people burning giant release. And, you know, there's a temple there that all week people uh, is a non-denominational temple. People go pray in the temple, write things on the walls, leave things from their loved ones that have passed away. And, you know, Saturday night, the man burns with this which is this giant you know crescendo of cacophony of of insanity that when it, the man burns it's just explosive and like mm. cathartic and then the next night sunday night the temple burn and it's eighty thousand people dead silent you can hear the temple crackle and people are just crying and like releasing you know wow. into into these rituals like it's 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 ancient ritual brought back for culture and some people go and that you know it's an ambient experience for them in that in that ritual way and other people whether they intentionally know it or just succumb to the symbolism of it and the ritual of it it really affects perception and i've seen oh yeah huge transformation there with people like bardic and i mean the desert does it too like two weeks in the desert gonna kick the shit out of you um so it's humbling 
you know, and then same that the dust storms there. It's like you got 80,000 people partying and building art and doing all these things. And when that dust storm comes in, everyone is equal. Everyone's, you know, huddled in a tent or got a dust mask and goggles on. And it's just like nature, the raw power of nature has come in and humbled everyone for yeah. that moment. When it passes, everyone rebuilds and celebrates. So yeah, it's really, it's really interesting. And it started from a loose pagan ritual, like the, the founder, Larry Harvey, it started in San Francisco and it, his girlfriend broke up with him and he was having some really emotional scenarios. So he built a burning man down on the beach, Baker's Beach in San Francisco. And then about 60 people or so circled around and they did this ritual of release the burning man. And, uh, and that was its early, early roots. And then everybody loved it so much. The next year they were like, let's do it again. And they built a bigger man, brought it down to the Baker's Beach and you know, and uh, the police were like, you can't do that here. And so they <laughs> stopped it. And then some of the people from the Kakanak Society in San Francisco and some other groups were like, well, we know where you can go and do anything you want. And that's when they went out to the Nevada desert and started Burning Man. And wow. the first year, Super Mad Max, like it was real, it was like mm -hmm. really crazy. And now it's huge and international. So there's, you know, the organization of it has, there's a little has... more safer rules than, yeah. You know, you talk about um, things like mm -hmm. ritual theater and the cathartic elements of the, the, whether it's music, whether it's, you know, watching someone perform with bl flaming blades or shooting fire or just the burning man, the, the, the burning of this large figure and, and, and the cathartic elements about it. You know, when, when I first got into, you know, paganism about seven or eight years ago, and it was, you know, a Northern European Germanic path that I followed you know it was it was very I was very new into it I, I came into this you know from previously being Christian my whole life so the whole religious aspect of the, the worldviews the 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 ceremonial the, the the ritual aspects of things was very new to me I hadn't quite ever felt anything like what I feel now but the the things that I have felt ever since coming into this path have have occurred when I'm doing things on a much smaller scale, but with things like what you're talking about, like we have uh, usually once a year during one of our um, holy tides, usually I think it, we, we've traditionally been doing it and during like the, the Seeger bloat uh, welcoming of the summer type events, we'll, we'll, build, we'll build a wicker man. He's about maybe six feet, seven feet tall tops, but it's, it's assembled from the branches and, and the twine and the straw and stuff that, that we collect ourselves by hand. And everybody in our little group puts their hands to the assembly of this figure. So when you set fire to him and, and everything, like to just the release of it, and it, I don't know, it's, it's on a much smaller scale, but I, I get the, the relation of it. And it is, it's so, uh, you know, you, you can't compare that to anything else that I've ever experienced in life, whether, you know, going to church. Right, let's say, or, or or any other sort. I'm not taken away from people that find value in that and that find meaning in that because that not the same things aren't for everybody. But I don't know, man. Like, I love how you talk about the the ritual theater, and I'm hoping we could talk a little bit about that. You know, combining your spirituality or or or, or putting focus. Uh, and, and giving life to those things, because otherwise it's just, you know, what do you read in a book? You know, the stories that were told by mouth. But then you're, you're taking those stories or you're, or you're applying those, the mythos, and, and you're bringing it to life by acting it out, by, by, by putting on the persona, by, by donning the ritual garb. I've been given so much shit over that over the years. You know, I, I get told that I'm possessed or that I'm, you know, evil or whatever because of the face paint or because of the look that I have. And I'm like, but it's, it's part of the ritual. It's, 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 it's embracing that aspect of your spirituality and really letting it carry you. And, and, and it carries others because they, they absorb it. They see it, they experience it, you know? Um, and you don't see that much uh, in like, you know, your traditional Western culture, <laughs> you know? And I mean, it is, it's, it's, it's transformational, you know? Yeah. And I say, uh, you know, I warn the crew when we're training, I'm like, okay, like, here we are, we're doing a theater show, or we're going to Burning Man, or we're going to these festivals, or we're doing whatever. And it's like, but this is ritual theater. This is deep, symbolic, you know, archetypical embodiments that we're tapping into. Like, you know, we're here to do this to, to help transform and create a cathartic experience for the audience. 
but it's going to happen to you first. You know, it's mm. like when you're embodying the gods, when you're embodying the animal spirits, you know, it has an effect on perception and consciousness, you know, and I, I dance in many worlds and hold many perspectives. Um, I've studied a lot of different traditions and mythologies from around the world and rituals from around the world. And I also see, study depth psychology and Jungian psychology and things like that. And there's, you know, there's that symbolic archetypical embodiment that really catalyzes and transforms perception and consciousness. Yeah. It, can, you know, it can make things happen. And now whether that's like on a realm of like deep metaphysical, you know, magical scenarios or symbolic psychological scenarios. Now I hold many different perceptions in that, but what I do see is that it works. And really that's the tools that I'm looking for and the tools that I'm looking to, to utilize. It's like, you know, I'm not quite sure how it works on the depth of the depth of it, you know, mm -hmm. whether it's, you know, psychological or whether it's deep metaphysical, but I see the transformation. I see what it does to the people embodying, you know, the animal spirits and the gods and the ancestors and the people in the audience that, you know, that witness yeah. it, the people that come up afterwards and are just like, that was like nothing I've ever Life -changing. seen. Life-changing. I felt, yeah, yeah, that I've never felt before. And it's, you know, it's been lost in our culture and that's, we're here to reclaim that, you know, and that's like the whole myth, the whole myth maker. It's like, we're here to make those myths. We're here to study the mm -hmm. ancient myths ancient tales and the ancient scenarios but we're here to make a new myth you know and that's what the artists would do you know to quote you know to loosely quote terence mckenna who is a phenomenal um a purveyor of consciousness and perception through the psychedelic and shamanic realms um but he said that was always the job of the artist was to pave new ways for culture and in yeah. this culture artists have been lost our artists have been you know slaves censored away. and all kinds of stuff you know yeah yeah so if you're a creative artist, you get censored or, or you get, you know, shoved in a corner. And if, you know, if you're a popular artist, you get told what to do by the culture and by the media machine. So it's just propagating the same bye bye shop, shop, shallow, shallow, as mm -hmm. opposed, you know, the role of the, the deep ritualistic artist that was the original purveyor of, of art was like that channeling the divine, that that magic spirit coming through and that artist tapping the unknown to lead culture into a new myth, into a new narrative, into a new story. And our culture has been looping because those that weave the new narrative have been feeding the old narrative that's shallow and disconnected. And so I think it's, you know, to inspire and empower the artist to tap into magic again, to tap into that inspiration where we're being controversial, we're bringing new ideas, we're bringing new pathways, new ways to think. Um, Educating, and, right? Yeah. And it's tricky in this world because that's not what this world embraces, but it mm -hmm. seems like that this world really needs. So yeah, so we're here to do it. It's not easy. <laughs> no, I, I mean, I think I speak for a lot of people in that, you know, uh, individuals like yourself and groups that you have assembled and, and people who share the a like mind as you, uh, I, I think I speak for a lot of people in that we appreciate that because it does help a lot of folks um, tap into that side of things that have been yearning to to break free, right? It's It's been like underneath the surface for so long that we just have been blind to it. And, you know, I've, I've, I've recently had some guests on here that, that also uh, uh, have uh, shamanic practices, you know, uh, J.M. Olufsen, Fjallvatir Workshop, James, um, from the uh, Raven Sage Healing out in Australia and some others, you know, so much of this, um, so much of these practices have been have been turning more towards the animism, the 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 living nature aspects, and you can't really talk about these types of things without bringing up, you know, people like McKenna and 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 some others that are that have just, you know, pioneers paved the way, really set yes. the the whole tone for these types of things. And I, I really think that because of that and because of because we're not over here just talking about tripping shrooms, bro, you know, like because it's not that it's it's deeper than that. Those may be aspects or elements to certain, uh, you know, the application, you know, in, in the addition of those psychedelics and whatnot, like I, I'm, I'm an advocate for it. And I think that it's they have their place, but we're not just sitting here talking about getting messed up like we're we're talking about living 
a living spirituality, a living way, a, a something that you just, you wake up, you live throughout your day, you go to bed and the cycle repeats and it's just the natural living aspect being connected uh, to life around us that has always been there. We've been able to see it exist and we, and we know that it exists, but, but our connection to that uh, level of, of existence is heightened when we talk about you know the, the the healing nature of the drum or the or the ceremonial ritual theater practices like it's well, and so many people are are into that and and doing the, the things that you like you do and, and others you mentioned like Wardruna and Heilung and Nitland and some of these other ceremonial bands that that bring this to their performance it, it awakens this I think primal nature within a lot of us you know absolutely and that's the thing is what are you know what are the tools you know, these are tools for us to tap into a more primal aspect of ourself, a more in tune with nature, a more ancient part of ourself. And there's a power there. There's a power there that's been missing from our community, you know, and the culture at large, you know, has trained us away from those powers, you know, and that's a much bigger conversation. <laughs> I definitely yeah. love philosophy and culture and perceptual conversations. But yeah, you, utilizing those tools, you know, and like I'm an advocate for responsible use of plant medicines. Um, I've studied definitely. a lot of traditions, everything from potentials of how it was used in, you know, our Northern European cultures to, you know, I spent 20 years in the Native American church, peyote church. I've been down to Mexico. I've worked with plant medicines in ritual aspects for a long time. And I mean, even the roots of all of Mythmaker and what I'm doing, um, you know, I was interested in studying in traditional Northern European ways before I played with and dabbled with psychedelics um but psychedelics were really what opened me up to a lot of this you know I was yeah they awaken you to the yeah I don't know well, that's <laughs> you know layer <laughs> and, and you know and that's kind of like you know I was kind of told to go do this in whatever you know aspect that was when I was a lot younger and when I was studying in the coven and I was curious about plant medicines because you know we're eating a little bits of mushrooms at parties as a teenager kind of thing and I was like there's something here. I don't think this is what people think it is. And, mm -hmm. you know, and I, my teacher asked the high priestess, I was like, well, what, it, what about plant medicines? And she was like, Oh, be careful with that. Like, you know, we do work with that, but in like higher levels of initiation, when you really have your foundations and you really know what you're doing, then mm -hmm. our, you know, works with mushrooms and things like that, but only in certain situations. So I really suggest against it. And she knew me so well, she was like, and I know when you don't listen to me and you go do it anyway, <laughs> that you should hide it from me and come to me. And so, yeah, the next weekend I had a party at my jam hall with my band and I ate seven grams of mushroom caps, <laughs> and uh, you know, had it in my hand and was like, what do you got? Like, there's something here. What do you got? And yeah. I had them in dental, otherworldly life expanding, dissolving into the cosmic universe, like seeing all my past like I had the most transcendental experience you know I'd had up until then that shattered my worldview and you know and something in that told me to go do these things that I'm doing and so that's kind of been like part of the passion and part of the drive of what I've been doing is you know something in the animistic unconsciousness through the use of plant medicines and ritual said go do these things and it's been a fun ride the whole time so it's been a lot of work no, it's brought a lot of perception and magic into the world. And I've seen how it's affected people's lives and I'm still here plugging away. Yeah. I mean, and that's gotta be rewarding, you know, when you've, when you've devoted um, your life to something and have touched people's lives in ways that it's visible to you, you know, like you can see the impact on the world or on a group, you know, that you have. And I mean, that's, that's rewarding and it, and it inspires you to, to uh to keep at it you know um i some so, so much of where i've kind of arrived at my stage of the game you know or where i've where I, where i came from to where i am now and then obviously not knowing where i'm sometimes i don't you know like i think i know where i'm going but at, at, on the other hand i'm also just kind of like just cruising like i'll get to wherever i get however i get there like i really have no destination in mind i'm just well whatever happens along the way i'm just gonna gonna you know deal with it but you know, like I talked about earlier, like me coming from Christianity into paganism and specifically like Germanic or Norse paganism, it was all about the gods, this, the gods, that, wherein 
I had absolutely no freaking clue about really what that meant. And it wasn't until I stepped away from that aspect of things and got closer to my community, got closer to my people and closer to like my immediate spirituality, like my ancestors and and the local spirits that dwell near and around me, the land, the house, you know, all of the various seen and unseen uh, spiritual beings that are as sentient and, and, and as present as, as we as humans are, we just maybe can't see them with the, the physical eye, but they are there. It wasn't really until then that I realized like, huh, now, now I focus on, on that more and I connect more with that, start realizing that the path to the gods is later on in, in, in the practice of things. It's not the first thing that one should come to. In, in my in my humble opinion, right? It's not, it, you may get that kind of like shocking romantic a- attraction to the gods or, or to the sacred, but you're not even, I don't, I don't, I don't think so many people are, are, are really gonna fully get that that connection to them because they are, they're different than us. They're, they're, it's to me, at least it's, you know, a separation between the sacred and the profane. There's, there's a definite difference between us as, as beings and, and, and how we are, a part of this, these, these realms, this, this world, this universe. So connecting in that way takes some time and it takes connecting to our higher selves, our, our, our more primal, you know, deeper spiritual natural forms to, to even get close to connecting to such the divine beings, you know, I don't know, like, that's just kind of where I've, that's where I'm at right now. And that's where I've come from. Just some of the things I've experienced. Yeah. And it's building relationship, you know, like that's what I've learned from a lot of the teachers that I worked with, you know, and I've worked, you know, I've worked with some, you know, worked with Volvas from, from Norway that we've done like, you know, deep, deep journeying into, you know, the ancient Norse traditions. Um, I've studied in Celtic witchcraft. I've studied in, you know, in lots of animistic cultures around the world from, you know, first nations here with the peyote to down in Mexico and down in South America and, you know, and things like that. And it's, you know, as we as we work with the Vitar, as we work with, you know, whatever, whatever the different culture has named for the unseen consciousness that pervades around us and the, the beings from everything from the little, you know, the little tiny gnomish beings to, you know, to the mountain Vitar, to, to the ancestors, to the gods, it's a relationship. You know, we're building a healthy relationship, we're getting to know and relating with these beings and that's you know what some of my you know northern mysteries teachers you know have told me it's like yeah like you're cultivating a relationship it's you know it's it's, i mean that's absolutely 100 percent agreed it kind of goes back to what i was mentioning when we first started here and i was introducing you and saying hey this guy's name is heron like it's it's his name is literally the name of a bird that i've come very close to in my nature walks and in walking through the river because it's like i'm walking in their room now I'm taking myself out of my house, my, my normal, you know, civilized living, you know, with my comfortable air conditioning and my climate controlled environments. And I'm, and I'm literally stripping down to the, my, my bare feet, you know, my bare skin, and I'm walking in the waters that these creatures, these, these beings, these uh, spirits live in and getting to share space and time and getting close to them and, and being around them, even if it's just, you know, for the moment. It's like, it, I don't know, man, like it's, it's so, it's like a gift each time to me to get a chance to share that space. And it's, it's like you say, building that relationship. And then when you build something, what do you have to do when, after you build it is you have to maintain it. It's mm-hmm. not that you just do it that one time. You're like, oh, I've reached my height and self. Like, no, man, you know, mm-hmm. you've just started the process. Now it's, now it's maintaining it. Now it's continuing that and cultivating it and nurturing it and all the things that come with with it. And I think one of the really neat things to think about um, is how with, with building things and with cultivating things, death occurs, destruction occurs, right? Animals, things, everything dies, everything, everything withers, right? There's that dormancy stage. There's that time when things have to be laid to rest, to be reborn, right? It's not all just like, oh, once you're here, you're here and it's all nice and fun and, and pretty and happy. And, you know, you're friends with each other and, you know, things get lost things die away and things sometimes you have to let things go but it's part of that relationship building and maintaining like i, I don't know how you think about that but to me it's, it's it's all part of the greater picture 
um, of things. Yeah, yeah, we're always shedding new level, levels and new layers, and you know, similar to the tower card, you know, I've I've mm. had aspects of my consciousness and perception crumble and rebuild enough times that uh, there's a fluidity there. It's like, oh, I don't doubt that the way I see the world now, and you know, and my beliefs or perceptions, you know, I don't doubt that they're gonna crumble again. To, you know, to another depth and another layer of, you know, of clearer perception, um, you know, right. and we're, you know, and we're taught in this, this broken, weird, you know, disjointed culture, how to perceive reality and what the description, the default description of reality is, and what being a human is and what nature is, you know, and as we loosen those descriptions, to seek something a little more closer to the truth, you know, the more those descriptions die. And those parts of us and those constructs of us die in order to be reborn into a deeper understanding, you know, of what is going on in nature, what is going on in the universe, what is going on in my mind, what is going, you know, who am I as a human and what is nature? And wait a minute, the story we were told is actually bullshit and nobody knows what the hell is going on. All these people <laughs> right. <laughs> run show, it's like, you know, they don't know what's going on. And the story that's going, the narrative that's going on in the world and the culture, you know, is a load of shit to keep us working in factories and you know monkeys making the gold you know as opposed to the old ways where it was curiosity you know it was that that seeking that like what is you know like oh then the all father you know that's his endless search for wisdom you know his endless sacrifice for wisdom you know it's like what is reality what is the world what is magic what is going on in the universe and how do i engage with that you know in my own way and there's few you know there's there's been very few people that have quested like that although there's a movement now where you know the old ways are coming back you know a lot of you know from nor from nordic you know ancient nordic north northern traditions to all over the world it's like you know we're not getting burnt at the stake anymore and we're able mm -hmm. to to question and be curious and you know i mean you could have a whole other podcast about how our culture is going in that, you know, in that way, our, in oh, our, to. The, the Northern heathen culture, you know, and I see, you know, I see a lot of challenge in that. I see a lot of baggage being brought from the broken default culture into our, you know, Northern heathen culture. And I see sure. a lot of fighting and a lot of, you know, a lot of those divisionary tactic, you know, when there's so much we could come together with. You know, and there's so, you know, there's so much to learn. And it's the having that, having the all father's curiosity, having the all father's, you know, ability oh, to yeah. break rules. You know, it's like, you know, I see so many people gatekeeping and so many people, you know, aiming other people and putting other people down that are just coming to the path and that. And, you know, I've been on this path for almost 30 years now, you know, and it's like, what would the all father do? You know, it's like, are you, you know, are you walking in the steps of Odin or are you the people that would oppose him? You know, because it yeah. wasn't cool and it wasn't, you know, it wasn't cool and it wasn't, you know, the, the way to learn Sather, but Odin sure learned Sather. They did, you know? yeah. yeah. Did you, you know, would, would, if the Allfather hung from the tree and brought his, I don't even remember the word, the term they use for a UPG or whatever, when you have a personal spiritual experience and people yeah. talk about it like it's inauthentic or less authentic than like old texts transcribed by Christians. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's like, well, where do you think those old texts came from? They came from ancient people, ancient shamanic people having personal experience. experience. You yeah. know, and so are you the person that when Odin came back from hanging from the tree, you know, and brought the runes, are you the person that would shame him and laugh and say, that's, that's your, you know, that's not authentic. You just made <laughs> that up, you know, or would you be like, oh my God, like, oh my God, you yeah. know, this, found this person just brought brought back keys in the building blocks of reality and how to tap in to, you know, to energy, magic, and perception and a language like, wow, I want to learn from this being, you know, and learn how he did it, not just learn what he brought back, but learn how he did it and do more of it. And that's going to, that kind of perspective will move our culture and community forward as opposed to the shame, blame, I know better than you, like, oh, well, you can't, you know, if you say that you're wrong, because da, 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 it's like, well, then Odin would have been wrong. And who are you to shame the all father? <laughs> you know, kind of. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I've always walked this really weird line, you know, where I've said before, like, I'm not what you would call a, re a hardcore reconstructionist type of pagan. Um, I do 
favor a lot of what has been documented. And I look to some of the sources as baselines or, or as to see, all right, well, how did they do it? And where can I, but I also, you know, don't, uh, I, I don't discredit and I don't shame anything that happens now and today in modern times, because kind of like what you were saying earlier about how you, we are making the myths, you are making the myths now, whether they be are based on ancient myths, but you're, you're creating new stories, right? We, we live in saga times. It's been mentioned by a number of people who I admire in this community um, in, in different ways, but we do, we live in saga times. So we are writing stories that get, that will get told in, in, in the days and in years to come. And mm -hmm. the things that may be what someone today would look at you and go, well, that's just malarkey. That's bullshit. That's, you know, that's your UPG. That's, that's not traditional. Well, who's to say in the next 100, 200, 500 years, whatever, that thing that was, you know, shrugged off as being baloney is, is, is the, the basis for someone's ritual practices at that time, right? Who's to say well, that? And as, as we just said, like the runes were Odin's UPG or whatever <laughs> right. you call it, you know, like, so do you, do you take that and learn from it? And is it tools that work or do you shame it before you've even given it a chance? You know, and I think that's something that, you know, that it's a lot, I think it's a lot of the baggage that, that our heathen communities bringing from the broken disjointed culture and from more of a Christian outlook and, a, you know, Christian dogmatic and yeah, you know, dogmatic and judgmental and, you know, and things like that, you know, and I mean, one of the interesting arguments that I see going on now that I roll my eyes at is the whole, you know, people shaming other people in the cosplay term or whatever, when there's people, you know, dressing up or wearing makeup, you know, or like putting, you know, doing the face paint and doing the thing. And then other like holier than thou, you know, I call them hipster heathens and that, you know, come in and are like, well, you can't edit it. And it's like, okay, maybe there's not complete archeological evidence. Like there is some references of, of eye makeup or whatever that, whether it was glare, whether it was, you know, as it, as, it, as in depth as people go with it in their dramatic aspects. Now, the fact that wearing a ritual garb, putting on face paint, doing things like that, they're ancient animistic practices that have happened all over the world to shift consciousness and shift percep perception. Yeah. You know, whether we're going to be super dogmatically by the book of whether our specific ancestors in, you know, the Northern European countries did it or not, that's a whole other argument. But the fact is, is it works. It's mm -hmm. like all over the world, people do. I've seen it. I've seen it in my theater crew. You know, it's like when we, you know, we do the dramatic makeup, we do the things like that. And I've done it in ritual. I've done it in music and I've done it in theater. And the thing is, is you see people change. You see yeah. people embody and go deeper into, you know, they're tapping into these ancient primordial powers, you know, through this, when they paint the runes on their face, you know, and they do the, the face with the different, you know, it's like, I've seen, I saw it a couple of weeks ago when we were practicing for our show for Burning Man, we're doing a whole retelling of the Ragnarok myth um, for wow. Burning Man. We've got Loki and Thor and, you know, and I embody Odin and we've got Freya and, and Graboda and Hela and like, you know, and I see these gals that, you know, when they put the cloaks on, hmm. when they put the cloaks on and when they put the makeup on, they transform, you know, yeah. and they're like, and they feel it. And then afterwards they're remembering that and they're going like, wow, that was profound. Right. You know, and who is anyone to shame that, you know, yeah. who is anyone to say, well, that's not powerful that's not real that's not whatever you know when i'm witnessing right here you know 50 yeah people, you're part of it yeah <laughs> yeah we got 50 people in a giant pagan heathen ceremony and we're you know we are wearing outfits and costumes we are lighting up swords on fire we're we're building giant metal dragons and lighting them on fire for like you know like the you know for the midgard serpent and like all these different things you know and it's like it's the, it's there you know and it's like when my buddy is like all beard braided and got the you know Thurizaz written on his face and he's built like a flaming Mjolnir and like he lights it up and you know it's like dude that guy's something he wasn't an hour ago I'll tell yeah. you right you know yeah <laughs> so, yeah so yeah you know I mean that's it's it's phenomenal I'm, I'm just I'm really glad to see the there that there's actually that there's some press for stuff like this you know that there's platforms that there's opportunity for this type of passion this type of genuine practice of things to get shared with the world because again there, there there's people like us that have 
been in it for any length of time that that know the sincerity that know the heart behind it and that see the value and want to share that and then there's people that are just clueless that may be new to this and they're seeing this and they're going what is that what is that about you know and they want to know more and it, it, it you know i i think it's great i really do um well and, so, it, and it's aspect of like how much are we opening the door how much are we putting out of the hand and it's like, like we've all been raised in this broken western culture and it's generations deep and so you know yeah. who are you to shame somebody else when like you know three five fifteen twenty years ago you were that same person making those same mistakes mm -hmm. you know? and so it's like yeah, yeah. It, it's like the whole like skull argument or whatever like everyone's like oh skull's not a greeting and it's like well no shit i know skull's not a greeting. <laughs> yeah. you know like i'm not like you know i don't know where it came from that everyone's doing this all of a sudden it's like of course it's not but like these new people that have watched the vikings tv show and are like feeling yeah. their heritage and feeling some sort of trickle of magic and ancestral power in that you know and yes maybe they're being cheesy about it or maybe they're you know just starting on a shallow level of it but are you going to, you know, are you going to smother that, shame that and bully that? Or are you going to reach out a hand and help these people, you know, learn how to engage with the ancestors, engage with the gods, engage with their roots. And then there's more of us Then mm -hmm. community that we're building. It's like, you know, I grew up on the reservation out east. Like I grew up on the res with like First Nations and stuff like that. And I've seen the desecration of the First Nations community and culture. You know, and I've sat with First Nations elders and I've been, you know, that the, they just see Christianity and, you know, and what's happened. And I'm like, you know, my people were really similar. Only it happened a long time ago. And they were the same skin color. You know, mm -hmm. like, you've got shamanic elders. We've got animistic practices. We've got, you know, and like a lot of First Nations people are like, oh, wow, let me, like, I want to hear about that. And a lot of that culture had to rebuild itself and come back together. And it was only you know, wiped out for a couple of generations or not even a generation, depending how far west you get. Whereas our people, it's been hundreds of years. And that's where I'm like, we need to come together. We need to help each other. We need to not be like battling each other and shaming each other. We need to yeah. be like reaching hand and having some compassion for the new folks that are like, skull brother. And it's like, hi. <laughs> it's like, yeah. It's like, hey, let me get a horn, pour some meat in there, and we'll cheers it. And like, you know, let's have a conversation, you know, talk about it. About like, I know you're really excited about what you're doing, but like, that's not actually how it works. Let me you're like, you're new here. And it's not yeah. like you're new here. You're wrong. Get the fuck out. It's mm -hmm. like, Hey, you're new here. That's, you know, that's not actually how it works. Come on over. Let's have it. Let's pour, you know, pour a horn of mead and I'll, I'll you know, I'll tell you how to, you know, I'll show you how to cheers. I'll show you how to do a blute or a bloat or, you know, like what's going yeah. on here, you know? And like, maybe you put that, dumb horn helmet away or like you know or like this what you know, like the thing you you know the, the weird halloween costume you just bought off amazon like you know i know you're excited and you're feeling it but like you know let's so, touch on the things yeah like you you know you see that that enthusiasm and i and i used to call it you know this uh this honeymoon phase you know the yeah the, this over romanticized feeling of that that like you say that that touch of magic of, of connecting with your ancestors or something about what you see or something about what you heard something about what you experienced touched you deeper than you have ever been touched before I'm not trying to get freaky with it but i'm just saying like it, it it affects you in a way that that's that's more profound than it has ever been before right and i love seeing that with people and i want to be the one that can help be a part of that and, and cultivate it in a way that they build from you know not feel shamed about you know and that's and like, what we yeah. need more of a powerful thing it's our ancestry it's our you know it's our lineage it's our gift of power from our ancestors that we were never given so mm -hmm. no surprise that people are kind of excited and and misinterpreting in a certain way you know it's like some kid sees you riding a bicycle and they're like oh my god i want to ride a bike and they get on the bike and they're like dragging it down the street and falling off of it four times <laughs> but don't just like laugh at the kid show them how to ride a bike you know it's yeah. like hey yeah it's cool to ride a bike you want to go you're like that's not how you do it this is how you do it. Let me show you as opposed to like, ha ha, you fucking suck. Well, it's like, well, <laughs> who's now? you know, and it's you know, right. You know, if we get a little bit more of that in our community, you know, it's something that, you know, we can build together, you know, and I've been to powwows. I've been to Sundances. I've been to, you know, these first nations ceremonies and communities that they've rebuilt their traditions 
you know, they've re-engaged together and they're not shaming and blaming each other. They're not like, you know, then they're doing like, you know, fancy dances with all these feathers and all this stuff. And like, maybe they're not traditional, maybe they are, you know, maybe some of those dances are 10 years old and some of those costumes are like new designs 10 years ago. They're not ripping each other apart and dividing over it. They're like, hey, cool new idea. Celebrating you know, like, it, encouraging yeah. it. Yeah. But you will getting it wrong. Then the elders are coming in or the experienced ones are coming in and going, hey, hey, that's not how you do it. And you can make a mistake there. But if it's a new idea. Yeah. You know, it's, you know, it's like, hey, how'd you do that? You know, as opposed to this consistent infighting that it's like, wow, there's so many of us reclaiming you know, this Northern heritage in the ancient mm-hmm. pagan, like in heathen ways, like we should be coming together and having big, parties. be having big, you know, festivals and concerts and, you know, and whatever. And, you know, there's a, there's a lot of things in the world to fight and each other isn't what, isn't, isn't one, of them. one of them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Know? 100% agreed. Mm-hmm. Well, I am definitely glad um, to get the chance to, first of all, talk about what you've been contributing uh, to, to, to the community, to this, to this country, to, to the world, even, you know, just being a part of Burning Man and having, you know, an international audience and presence and, and having, you know, a, a group and a community of people that are like-minded to the point of, you know, doing it that way and, and being welcoming in that way. That's really great to hear. And I'm excited to see, um, all the progress, right? So there's, there's, this, there's Mythmaker Productions, there's the Weirding Way, there's the Warriors Path YouTube channel, Anything else that people online, if they want to kind of follow your journey and follow your story and keep up with you, is there anything else that the listeners and viewers can, uh, can check out on, on, on the social medias or on the internet that tells them more about what you're up to? Um, those are the three main ones. Like I've got my hair and, you know, Facebook stuff. I'm always organizing on Facebook and doing stuff on there. It's got me. I wish there was a better platform, but there's not right now. And mm. I'm organizing tons of people. Um, but yeah. Mythmaker is the main the main thing I'm known for. The Weirding Way is my super band ritual passion right now, and then Warrior's Path is where you know I share my teachings and my you know and my engagement and what I've learned along the path. And yeah, study with a lot of different people, and I've got the spiritual shit kicked out of me enough times. I've been hum- humbled many many times to uh, you know rebuild my worldview and rebuild my perception, and I'm here to help. You know, like, that's the thing is like, I'm really here to see this community shine, to see individuals shine and to really see us like regain that ancient ancestral power. And that's really the purpose of Mythmaker and the Weirding Way and Warrior's Path is for, you know, our heathen pagan community to come together and for us to, you know, to be a people again. And, you know, I'm very into that, you know, and different people have their different traditions and that's, that's all fine and dandy. And, you know, us reclaiming our traditions and integrating them in a in a modern way where you know they're practical and they're really helping you know individuals and communities um so yeah and that's what myth maker is we're making that new myth creating that new narrative um the mom of my kids um is a counselor and you know she's been on the pagan path for a long time too and so she's doing a lot of we're actually talking about doing a podcast series about um heathen integration like how Mm. you know i'm seeing lot in the community of people coming from a christian background and she comes from a christian background i thankfully don't i was never really told (laughs) anything so i'm thankful for my neutral background um that i got to explore i didn't have to deprogram a lot of stuff i mean there's the ambient stuff and culture that i've had to deprogram but i wasn't super indoctrinated into one of these you know abrahamic religions um that i feel are pretty away from the animistic root and, you know, she and her partner both have in two very different scenarios and they're both, you know, integrated transpersonal psychologist counselors. And so we're talking about putting a program together for, you know, people coming back to heathenism, people coming back wow. to paganism, because there's a lot of Christian baggage, baggage, oh, there's yeah. a lot of baggage, there's a lot of, you know, people that are taking, you know, Jesus and God and then just like slapping Thor and Odin over top. And then there's still kind of like the deeper yeah. operating system is still really Abrahamic. And it's like, oh, yeah. you know, if you tap into some deep primal animistic stuff, like that's not how we do, you know, that's not how yeah. it's been done, you know, and even in, you know, the Christian interpretations of some of the old writings and stuff like that, it's like, I come from a real animistic background, you know, where you can smell the Christianity, you can smell mm-hmm. the Abrahamic 
oh, wait a minute. That's, that's not how earth people did things. That's not how animistic people did things. That's someone's lens affecting their interpretation of what our people did. And you can taste it. You can smell it when you've, you know, when you've spent enough time in the woods by yourself, right. time with other cultures that are animistic, you know, you can be like, oh, actually, when you're in tune with nature, that's not how you perceive things. When you're separate from nature, then you put those paintings on top. So yeah, so we're working, she's, her and her partner are working a lot on their counseling business with that. And we're working on putting a series together and doing some writings on how to transition from, you know, Christianity to heathenism, to paganism, to, you know, to get back into the deeper aspects of, of what the ancient traditions are and what the, the way our ancestors would be. Um, cause yeah, not just about like, Ooh, I watched Vikings and I read the Havamal, all. And now, uh, you know, I oh, got a so hammer, you know, yeah, and I, I, and I got a drinking horn and you know, whatever. <laughs> yeah. But then I'm still like, you know, judgmental and guilt, shame ridden and like, you know, and, and, you know, and all these things. And it's like, well, you gotta dig a little deeper. There's a whole, yeah, there's a whole worldview shift that you have to embrace and, and it doesn't happen overnight. And, um, that's interesting. You know, if, uh, if you're a part of that project and you ever are looking for a guest, um, I would volunteer as tribute, just put that bug out oh, yeah. there in the universe. So if you're ever looking to get a guest on a podcast or talk about stuff like that, I'd be uh, really down to, to rap about it for a bit. Um, and this has been great. I think we've, we've covered a lot and we could, we could probably, I, I have a feeling that you're the type of person here and that, you know, if given the time and, and, and limitless uh, resources, we could sit here and probably lose hours and not even realize it, you know? Oh yeah. We could do a series. <laughs> <laughs> and we might do that. I mean, it, it, we might have you back. Uh, I mean, I, I, I would love to say that I would love to have you back um, when and as our schedules permit uh, to talk about some other things, maybe together we can come up with just some topics and, and stuff. Cause I feel I enjoy this. I think the people uh, listening and subscribing and watching this, uh, this, this podcast are all about it too. I, I really feel like this is going to, touch on a lot of people's hearts and, and stuff. So, uh, you know, thank you from, from myself and thank you on behalf of everybody that's, that's being able to, uh, to absorb this. It's been, it's been a lot of fun. Yeah. You're welcome. You're welcome. And yeah, just tell people, you know, live your legend, make your myth, you know, we got, here we are in this weird world at this cutting edge of culture and everything else. It's like, you know, build giant flaming dragons, light up your sword on fire, you know, do your thing, make your myth, be who you want to be. It's like, you know, yeah. shed the shackles of, you know, all this, like everybody picking on each other, but whatever. It's like, do fun shit. Put on the light. paint, man. Wear the, yeah. wear the mask, put on the robes, do it, do it. Do yeah. It. As long as you're yeah. not hurting, do it. Yeah. <laughs> do what makes you feel good. Do what works for you. Do what gives you power and, uh, you know, dig deeper, study it more. So yeah, I'm, I'm here to help. That's, that's my journey. I'm just here to see people shine and see people tap into their their ancient roots again and their ancient power again. So I'm doing my best to engage in that path as much as I can. Absolutely. So I'm going to, I'm going to be linking the, you know, Mythmaker Productions, the weirding way, the warrior's path, your, uh, your, your hair and, you know, Facebook for any way that you're just told me that people can find you, get a hold of you, anybody listening and watching, if you're wanting to, you know, follow along with Heron's uh, journey and everything that he's a part of and, and uh, learn along the the way with him check out the description area check out the show notes um all of his stuff is going to be linked down there so definitely follow like share subscribe to all of what he does you know yeah. engage in that way support him in that way and i don't think you'll regret it i know i haven't so yeah. and i'm not just so, saying it because you're here i mean i've been saying it ever since i'm like i can't wait to get this guy on a podcast man it's gonna yeah. be great <laughs> heathens in the desert where we have open applications and you know and we do the shit, you know, we train people up and, you know, we do it. Doing so the real stuff, doing the real work. Yeah. Yeah. Wing swords and drink mead in the desert. <laughs> I'm going to yeah. have to make it out there one of these days, man. Figure out a way, you know, just get in the car and go. Um, yeah. That'd be gnarly. <laughs> Maybe film some content together, do something. Who knows? Totally. Totally. Sweet. All right. Well, I'm going to jump off of here. Uh, everybody that's listening, watching, check out the description and show notes to support Heron and everything that he does. Uh, Heron, I'll jump off of here and talk with you in a moment. But for everybody listening today, watching today and engaging, thank you so much. And don't forget uh, to show your support for Midgard Musings and the Random Heathen Ramblings podcast by liking the videos, upvoting the podcast, subscribing, following, doing all the 
social media engagement things, staying relevant. It's much appreciated and it means the world. So thank you all so much for tuning in today. Hail and may the gods continue to notice you and may your answers always, ancestors always smile upon you. And we'll see you in the next episode. Hail.